Hey guys, in this video I'll walk you through the realization of a Voronoi pattern, an incredibly versatile instrument that must be known by every digital artist. The reason for that is very simple. With this pattern it's extremely easy to simulate many structures that form spontaneously in nature. In fact, this pattern can be found literally everywhere, in the giraffe fur, in the turtle shell, in leaves, in dragonfly wings, in the way dry soil breaks up, in garlic clove, in soap bubbles, in corn cobs, in the way trees share space, in bread alveolation, in the ananas skin, and much more. Hexagonal grids can be obtained with Voronoi too, they're just a special case. And these allow us to include things such as the honeycomb and the fly eyes into the list. The reason behind Voronoi omnipresence in nature is due to the fact that it is based on an extremely simple rule of spatial subdivision. In fact, this pattern emerges automatically when in a cluster of individual entities of equal strength, each element competes to share a finite amount of space. Each individual fights to expand as much as it can, but its neighbors, which are doing the same, exert resistance. To generate the pattern, as first thing, we have to subdivide the space with a grid. Such space in this tutorial will be represented by the UVs. To visualize the grid we can add a fract node. Each one of these cells will hold a point at its center, which will be offset in a random direction. This will cause the distortion of this regular grid into a Voronoi pattern. Such points I'm talking about are, practically, the origin coordinate of each cell. Let me visualize them. To offset them, we need to generate a random value per cell. We can use the cell noise after transforming the grid space to 3D. We can use the third coordinate, otherwise useless, as a random seed, if we want. We can use the first two channels of this noise as 2D vector to operate the offset after remapping them to minus 0.5, 2.5 range. The range is not from minus 1 to 1, because the points are in the middle of a 1 by 1 cell, so they only need to offset 0.5 to reach its edge. Now, these offsets can be added to the grid cells, and we can use the result into the debug nodes to visualize the offsetted points. We can also add some control over the max amount of offset we apply. Now, to generate the pattern, we have to, for each cell, calculate the distance gradient and confront it with the neighbors. Then, for each pixel, we'll keep the one that has the minimum value. So, Let's start by calculating the gradient of the single cell. We are actually already doing that to draw our debug points. To obtain them, we are subtracting from the offsetted grid space the cell position to obtain the UVs local to the offsetted cell, which we then center on point 0.5. Then, it's just a matter of calculating the distance of each cell pixel from the local origin. As you can see though, each cell is just considering its own distance field now. It has no visibility on its neighbors. The only way we can make it do so is, in each cell, repeat the calculation 8 more times for the neighbors, which translates to repeating 8 more times this chunk of code we wrote 
but each time adding an offset in the direction of the neighbor we want to sample. To add the possibility for each cell to evaluate the distance field of another one, we just need to add to the coordinates a vector 2 for the offset. Be careful to not connect the neighbor cell data to the final add, otherwise you will be shifting the entire grid. Since we now need to replicate these nodes 8 more times, I think we should put them into a material function, to keep things tidy and readable. The positioning I chose for these 9 node blocks is not random. This disposition will help us to visualize what we are about to do and make it easier. Let's say that this node placed at the center is our current cell. Then all the other ones represent its neighbors at their exact relative position. So we can set their offsets accordingly to their position. And now each one of these nodes correctly samples a different neighbor of the central one. Let's store the value of each cell distance field in a named reroute node. After doing that, we just need to calculate the minimum value among all the distance fields. And finally our Voronoi is starting to pop out. With a little change to what we already wrote, we can colorize the Voronoi cells too. Let's expose the cell random color in the material function as first thing. And save all those values to more named root nodes. Now, the process to colorize the cells will be a bit tricky to follow in a node-based environment, but the logic is very simple. We will calculate the difference between distance fields in pairs and will use the sign of the result to decide which one of the two corresponding cell colors we are going to keep. And then we'll do another round of comparisons between each pair of each result and so on, until we will remain with just one value. Let's position all our getters in the graph. And now, let's do the comparison between the first two by subtracting their distance fields. If the result of this operation is negative, we have to pick the color of the first element, otherwise the second one. To do that, we just need to contrast the gradient created from this subtraction to a binary mask, and center it if we really want to be finicky, before saturating it. Doing this operation, instead of simply using the sign node, can be useful in the eventuality we decide to have blurred transitions between the cells. Now, just add a LERP node to use this mask to interpolate between the two colors. And that's the first one. We have to repeat the same operation for every other pair of named reroutes. As you can see, there's one cell that remains out of these comparisons. Don't worry, it will be added at the end. Now we have to repeat the same comparisons with the results we got in pairs. To do so though, we first need to combine the distance fields. And we are ready to do the second wave of comparisons. And that's it. We now got our colored Voronoi cells with the distance field that we actually calculated again. So we can delete the previous mean operation series we did. And now you're ready to implement into your shaders some fancy effect that uses Voronoi.
If you know a bit the options available into the vector noise node, you may be wondering, why should they go over all this trouble of implementing Voronoi from scratch instead of just using the one the engine already provides me? Well, if you just need to use a Voronoi pattern without any special requirement, you're definitely good to go with the built-in one. But the fun part about self-implementing it is the amount of control you have over it and the incredible number of different ways you can play with it. One thing that you can't usually do, for example, is to control the maximum offset of the points, as we already have done. And what about controlling it with a texture, for example? or animating the cell, as I'm doing right now. There is also the possibility of creating a much more fancy implementation of this wonderful pattern, of course, which will be discussed in future videos.